Welcome to our book discussion today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome a great panel and uh, discussing an excellent book. Um, so first of all, I'd like to welcome the author, Erdi Öztürk, who is, a, who is a, a lecturer of politics and international relations at London Metropolitan University. And he has published this book here. So it exists in real life. It's not just a, a, an electronic ephemeral product, but a real, a real book called Religion, Identity and Power, Turkey, and the Balkans of the 21st century. Um, and here to discuss this book with us, we have two uh, well-qualified uh, speakers, Sabina Pacharis, who has uh, recently submitted her PhD at Queen Mary University in London and has done research on the role of Turkey in Serbia in particular, welcome. Um, and Dimitar Bechev, who is a, a visiting fellow, research fellow at the EVM, um, the Institute for Human Sciences or Social Sciences in Vienna. Uh, I never know the English translation, I know the German original, um, and also the author of a forthcoming book on Turkey, um, which is going to be appearing probably in the course of this year. Is it gonna come out this year, Dimitar? Hopefully early next year. Okay, great. So the process. Okay, well then we'll have a, a book panel on that book. But um, now we're going to be focusing, first of all, on Erdi's uh, book, uh, which looks a lot at kind of Turkey's, uh, Turkey's engagement in the Balkans. And of course, as, uh, as the title also suggests, Turkey is in the Balkans, but engaging in uh, other parts of the Balkans, so to speak. Um, so the way we're going to be proceeding today is that uh, Erdi will briefly introduce the book and then our two discussants will uh, offer their thoughts and their comments. Eddie will have a chance to respond, and then afterwards we'll be opening up for questions and comments. Um, so you're welcome to do so, but uh, please do so through the raise your hand option. Uh, and then uh, you're, when I call you, you can just uh, activate your camera and your microphone and ask the question to our three speakers and to the author. So first of all, Eddie, let's hear a little bit about the book. What are the kind of key points? What are the motivations? And then kick off the discussion like that. The floor is yours. Okay, I have to uh, give you a- yeah, Thank you so much, letting me, let, let me to speak. Thank you so much. I mean, Florian is, I mean, it's great pleasure uh, to be in here today. And thank you so much for all these arrangements, organizations, and many thanks for your generous uh, endorsements that I would like in on the book. And also I would like to thank the Sabine and uh, Dimitar that I learned a lot, particularly I have a story in the book about Dimitar's uh, studies. I mean, I would like to thank again, it's 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 pleasure to be in here actually. Uh, very briefly, I mean, in between two, particularly between 2014 and 2017, and then uh, in sometimes in 2018 and in 2019, I I lived in Ljubljana, I mean the capital of the Slovenia. But we know that I mean the Ljubljana is not a classical Balkan capital, but as all of you know that it's just like one and a half hour from Graz. Uh, you can smell every single taste of the Balkans, thanks to the uh, migrants, uh, like latecomers from Bosnia, Serbia, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, Kosovo, and Albania. And while I was conducting some research regarding very different issues, I realized that, I mean, the every single individual who has been coming from the Balkans, it's a different part of the Balkans, have been following Turkey, Turkish news, Turkish politics, culture, very closely, and uh, they have been they have different and variable feelings about Turkey and they commonly underline one particular point both negative and positive sides very influential impact of of Turkey particularly under Erdogan's prime minister period and presidency period I mean this I mean I define this term as a Turkey is back because after I read Dimitar's 2012 Inside Turkey article regarding how Turkey is back or not directly back I realized that everyone actually talking about the, the, this phrase I mean the, the, the frame that uh, that's uh, distributed by Dimitar Turkey is back and then, I mean, even though Dimitar talked about Turkey as being one of the key local, uh, key, key, key focal and the dominant actor in the region, I mean, I just would like to scrutinize 
what is this Turkey's back? How we can understand this Turkey's back position while scrutinizing different actors' uh, behaviors, perceptions regarding Turkey and the Turkey's, uh, Turkey's uh, transformation? Because this Turkey's back argument is very di diverse at the same time among ordinary people, semi-academics and academic circles. In this regard, some claim that the policies of the successive Justice and Development Party governments and the political strategies of the mastermind of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan concerning the Balkans have long been energized by Turkey's desire to reestablish political, economic, religious, and cultural hegemony in the region throughout the various quote-unquote neo-imperialist, neo-colonial projects. But at the same time, others argue that Turkey and the Balkans have reached the peak point of their mutual beneficial relations, economic engagements, and proactive utilization of the transnational state apparatus of Turkey. Within these two different sides of the one particular coin, I, I, I mean, uh, I scrutinize some particular issues, uh, positions, positionalities, and the roles in the region, religion, identity and power, because all of my interviews, all of the academic and the semi-academic writings, one way or another mention these three dynamics and their, uh, their important uh, role in the region. Therefore, I scrutinize Turkey's increasing involvement and activism, seeking the uncover of the role of religion and power-oriented identity reflections in the Balkans particularly in the 20, 21st century. Therefore, I mean, my this brand new book eliminates the aspects of Turkey's relations with its Balkan neighborhoods in the context of the broader shift in domestic and foreign policy under very changeable and very complicated justice and development party regime. And what I argued that there is a conversion in Turkey's foreign po domestic politics from a realist secular orientation to an adventurous and I think ambivalent one featuring ethno-nationalist coercive signification of the state identity. Therefore, my study explains the complex relation between religion, state, and state identity and signification in Turkey, and as they reflect on state power resources in various and in complicated ways. And I mean, to explain all of these, to analyze how these concepts have been utilized and how these presents have been received locally, I mean, the book draws on a fieldwork conducted between partially uh, early 2016 and very early 2019, including more than 100 semi-structured elite interviews with experts, political actors, diplomats, religious leaders, scholars, as well as journalists, and also ordinary citizens, particularly in three country cases, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Albania. But at the same time, uh, I mean, you you read, uh, you, three of you read the book and you can see some of the interviews from Kosovo, from Serbia, from Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, all around the world. I mean, I got many questions about this book, whether it's a, Tur it's, it's a book about Turkey, is it a book about the Balkans? If I had the chance to, Decide the title instead of the marketing office in Edinburgh University Press, most probably I'll put something different about the title because this study taking Turkey and three particular Balkan countries as a testing ground. I mean, as Jonathan Fox underlines in his underlines in his endorsement, this study mostly regarding the complex relation between religion, identity, and power. So I'll just say one couple of sentences regarding the theoretical, possible theoretical contribution of that book. What I argued in the book, as an instinct part of an identity, religion has the capacity to shape politics and power relations, as well as state identities. And I think religion and religion-oriented political power struggles to the extent that it forms the state identity, therefore religion can shape both domestic and foreign policies, even if the actors, decision makers are themselves secular. This is, I mean, I also argue that the countries have multi-phase, multi-layered identities, and some of which have direct and an indirect relation with religion. And these different relations with religion could be seen among many identity determinants of the states. 
indeed, I mean, it is. this is not a genius claim, but this is also at the same time a new finding in the literature about religion and global politics. And it would be very easy to scrutinize all of these transformations from different part of the world's history. Europe, USA, United Kingdom, I mean, even in the Latin Americans. But I mean, Turkey is a perfect example, which is the first secular, I think I would like to use laic uh, states, who has been transforming its state identity from a former empire. But at the same time, this separation between church, uh, between mosque and politics is not a cl clear, clear cut. Instead of Turkey prefer to use, manage and regulate religion and the religious issues, not only in its domestic politics, but also in its foreign policy. Therefore, I argue that religion has always been an important determinant for the foreign policy and the domestic politics, even if the actors could be secular. And using religion as a foreign policy tool has always been talking about the religious soft power or instrumentalization of religion in foreign policy. And I think in the 21st centuries, these terminologies are not enough to define some countries' religion-oriented transformation. In the literature, what we saw that there has been a many different definitions regarding contemporary Turkey's foreign policy and domestic policy behaviors. The first is that they define Turkey only authoritarian country or authoritarian and a populist country without talking any kind of different particular parts of the power groups. This book, I mean, rejecting all of these uh, simplistic claims to define Turkey as an only populist or an authoritarian country, it argues that Turkey has always been uh, Turkey's power or the power components has always been as a collapse of different components. And if would like to define Turkey's religious soft power, it is quite simplistic to define the increasing of a religious soft power and then the decreasing of a religious soft power because soft power is not something like that you can calculate or measure. And I think if we would like to define soft power and the Turkey's transformation and its impact in the, uh, in the, in the Balkans, it is only way to define it as an ambivalent soft power. So we did all of these two claims, uh, arguments, I underline that Turkey, particularly after the first decade of the 21st century, like many other countries all around the world, is gradually withdrawing from an international cooperation and is restoring a new distinction between concept of civilization by synthesizing nationalism, very nostalgic and subjective understanding of history, memory, and Sunni Islam. And this transformation has been evacuating, creating under the control of not only one particular leader, but also his changing unofficial and unconventional coalition partners. It was the formerly the Gulenists, the liberals, but right now it is the Islamist, nationalist, Eurasianist, and they've been trying to change the Turkey's not only foreign policy direction, but also civilization codes. In this regards, I mean, some underline that Turkey is a game changer and increasingly involving all the global audiences, or some also uh, claiming that this is a uh, in, this is the symbol of the how Turkey's soft power is being uh, declining and Turkey being a uh, being a uh, naughty boy all around the world. I'm rejecting all of these ideas in this book because since for me, the transformation of Turkey's state identity under Erdogan and with his coalition partners have been creating a jargoning effect. And within this effect, different coalition groups, religion, identity transformation, and the power competitions have been playing a dominant role within this process. And it is obvious that indeed, I mean, the the, 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 in the Turkish case, there is reconciliation and the instrumentalization of Sunni Islam, different understandings of Turkish nationalism with Erdogan's right wing, not exactly populist, but relatively populist and aggressive foreign policy strategies have created different tensions with other countries. But in the Balkans, we have been seeing a very different scenario to compare to France, Germany, or other Western countries due to the Balkans demographic and the political situation. For this book, as I said, I choose three different countries, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Albania. I got 
different criticisms. Why there is no Bosnia? That should be a Serbia. I mean, it's it's impossible to cover all the ten more than ten countries in one book and in a, in a dissertation. And I and there are many studies about Bosnia Herzegovina, about Serbia and Sabina. Uh, I hope it. I, I would easily say that it will be a forthcoming book from one publisher. But there are many studies. But there is no only. There is only local language or the Turkish studies about Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Albania. And also these countries will eligible at least not the full photo, but the, my, the, the, the big, like some parts of the big photo of the Balkans. And I would like to read one phrase from uh, Mihail Ivano, one of the chief advisor on the minority rights to the uh, Bulgarian, former Bulgarian president, Jelil Jelalev. And in this quote, it says, uh, Mihail Ivano says that, we invited Turkey and Turkey's transnational state apart to Dianet because Turkey's like secular mentality. We knew that only secular Turkey and the modern Turkey can serve our Muslim majorities and can take uh, our Muslim citizens and can take, take care of them. If we didn't invite Turkey in the first place, most of the fundamentalist and extreme groups could affect our Muslims maybe in a bad way. But after 20, after 30 years, I would say that we did a wrong decision. I mean, this is a shocking sentences. I mean, one particular foreign country invited other countries, re, uh, religious, transnational religious institution, because of it is one particular identity, it's one particular civilization code. And only three countries did it. North Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Albania. And I scrutinize the transformations within these countries to understand the issues. And also, I mean, you know better than me, you are the Balkan experts, I'm not. Uh, these, these countries will give like different dynamics, majoritarian Muslim, non-majoritarian, non-majoritarian country. One is the EU, EU, EU candidate. The other one is one of the most westernized Balkan country, so on and so forth. So this will enough to give us a full photo. I mean, to cut it short, what I found after reading all Turkey's domestic political transformation, whether it is foreign policy and in the reflections in the Balkans around a decade, what I found particularly for the last 20 years, uh, I found four essential points. The first thing is that currently Turkey has been seen as a kind of an Islamic country which aims to serve the global ummah. Despite all the other activities, when one look at the investments of Turkey and how these investments are perceived by local elites in the region, there is a problem in this point. Even though some local elites and some ordinary citizens in the region are very happy about the Turkey's increasing investment in every single area, uh, some of them are quite worried because Turkey's, when you look at the, all the data, Turkey's most of the investment, uh, despite of their uh, objectivity claim, the, their investments are mostly distributed by the Sunni Muslims. And therefore, I argued that Justice and Development Party realized that Turkey's former Western oriented secular foreign policy has not been serving the new interests of Turkey in the Balkans. And so the current regime aims to establish deeper relations with the Balkan countries, but particularly using or via or throughout the Muslims of these countries. Turkey is in fact preferring to serve the global ummah instead of expanding relations with all the components of the Balkans in spite of its fragile economic conditions. This service to the global ummah, as I said, would make some of the components in the Balkan Muslims are very happy, but at the same time worrying most of the local elites because it also serves the global revival between some of the Muslim majority countries uh, such as Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Iran, and, uh, and other Gulf countries. The second thing is that even though some of the uh, Balkan Muslims and the local elites are being the part of the Turkey's internal conflict, particularly since 2013, Turkey has been exporting its domestic conflicts via transnational institutions, and this has been creating a security issue for the Balkan countries. We all know the uh, news about the kidnapping six Gulenists from Kosovo, but this issue is not limited in the Kosovo. And one can easily argue that this 
I would say war between Gulen movement, very interest-based, very power-based conflict is over in Turkey, but it is still alive in the Balkans and has been a big indicator. And I mean, not only Turkey using official or legal transnational state apparatus, but at the same time, I wouldn't say illegal, but there are many different de facto ways. And this conflict has been changing Turkey's perceptions behavior patterns in the region and creating a security issue for the for the for the region and for the region even though some of the countries giving some different reactions there is the these reactions is very much based on the power relations and the hierarchy rankings uh, of these countries and turkey but i would say that Bul bulgaria for example is fine to handle with the turkey's arguments or uh, demands but on the other hand north macedonia has been staying in quite weak position uh, on the one hand, Albania seen that issue as a kind of a sovereignty problem, but at the same time, due to the huge investments of the Gila movements in the Albania, the, the issue is one of the daily topics of the Albanian politics. So this has been creating a kind of a problem in the, in the region. The third issue is that regarding the interfering the internal affairs of the countries, Turkey's new foreign policy approach incorporates with the AKP's neo-Ottomanism, not Turkish neo-Ottomanism, because most probably we will talk about it. There are many different types of neo-Ottomanism in the Turkish history, but the AKP's neo-Ottomanism, and it manifests to desire to intervene and, if possible, became a dominant actor in the uh, in the host countries or the foreign countries' uh, domestic politics. This has been creating a big sovereignty problem for all over this, all over the country, of all over the three different countries. I mean, they divided the one and only Turkey party into two pieces in Bulgaria. They tried to establish new political parties with different kinds of fundings in Albania, in North Macedonia, and it has been creating a sovereignty problem, as I said. The last point is that, I mean, it is the overdose using of Sunni Islam and the nationalism with relatively right-wing and the populist and aggressive foreign policy of Turkey in the region. Many elites in the region think that, likewise the uh, uh, Limanos quote, Turkey might be quite harmful for the very fragile and very problematic, stable, secular, and quote unquote, peaceful environment of the Balkans. This is a very, a uh, negative connotation when we compare the Turkey's Tur when we compare the Turkish image in the eyes of the Balkans, and when we look at these four issues, as I said, these are not the uh, these these four is not written on the stone. There are also very happy cate categories, very happy populations, and the components in the Balkans. And but these are mostly based on the class relations, and we can only explain all of these issues by using Gramsci and Agamben. But all in all. What I would say that Turkey in the region using overdose of religion, using overdose of nationalism and becoming a very aggressive and trying to be the very visible in the region without considering the uh, Balkan priorities or the Balkan demographic uh, and normative dynamics, it has been becoming a yes, impactful power. Yes, still it is a kind of a soft power, but if one would like to define Turkey as a kind of a power, kind of an actor in the region. There is only one way, or I think the one of the most logical way for me, uh, is to define Turkey as an ambivalent actor who, who, who converted it is a state identity after many critical junctions and used the coercive ethno-nationalist signification in the region. So, under these circumstances, what I said that religion and identity and power has played a big role on Turkey's presence in the region and tur Turkey's every kind of single transformation, every kind of Turkey's transformation in, the, in its domestic politics, one way or another found a visible position in the Balkans while using transnational, religious, transnational apparatus and using religion, identity and power dynamics in the region. I know, I mean, I put like many great points and I'm very much hearing the thoughts and uh, try to clarify these great points in, in the Q&A session. And I, 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 I try to keep my limit, my time limit. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Erdi, uh, for giving us this, you know, wide palette of thoughts and, and uh, underlying uh, findings of this book. So now I would like to ask first Sabina and then Dimitar to give their take of what they took, took up from the book and maybe raise some questions we can then discuss. So Sabina, go ahead. 
Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, comment at this book in, at the University of Graz, which is such a hub for all of us. And uh, for me personally, it was just like the other way around from my thesis. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll first, and you really did uh, excellent work, especially in addressing uh, a very under-researched aspect, which is the role of religion uh, in foreign politics and especially role of religion in uh, soft power. And uh, looking at the Turkey-Balkan relations, which very often, not only in political, but even sometimes in academic discourses, especially when it comes from US academics, tends to be interpreted under the umbrella of war on terror. So somehow there is this broad brush painting and uh, formulating Turkey almost as Salafist supporter. And you're telling us that it's way more complex. And indeed, uh, you did uh, run into fast waters looking at very complex relations between religion, state identity, domestic and foreign politics in Turkey, which are equally as complex in the Balkans, even without Turkey. Uh, but now you're actually looking at the both sides of complexity and how they intertwine. And the good news is, yes, you did go into fast waters, but you didn't drown. <laughs> so I definitely liked uh, the concepts uh, that you used and the key concept, uh, as you say, coercive ethno-nationalist sunification which I will return to later. I definitely very much liked uh, that you start the book with Turkey is back, which for me epitomizes uh, basically your main points, how ambiguous is uh, Turkish involvement through religion, because Turkey is back is almost inevitable if you're going to study Turkey-Balkan relations, you're going to hear it for sure but uh, it's uh, pronounced very differently. For some, it's, uh, it evokes fear, disgust, and for others, it's almost an admiration. So for me, that phrase itself at the very beginning epitomizes the ambiguity of uh, Turkish uh, involvement, which is very complex, very controversial, and uh, with uh, many tendencies to be misinterpreted, scandalized, exaggerated, or simply even by the Turkish side taken for granted. Uh, and uh, as you have said uh, uh, already, uh, there is this tendency of uh, monolithic approach toward the case studies, uh, uh, of uh, Turkish monolithic approach towards the Balkan countries, sorry. And in that sense, I very much like the choice of your case studies. Uh, I know I should be criticizing you, but let me say the good stuff. <laughs> Uh, critiquing. Uh, I actually like that you chose these three countries which uh, are similar in uh, which, because you're bringing the broader geostrategic developments and the fear from Salafi uh, influences and inviting Turkey in that sense. Each one of them has a, a significant Muslim population uh, and all of these, uh, many of these populations have this uh, kind of uh, narrative of suffering and closeness uh, to Turkish identity. Albania is more complex in that sense, uh, but in Bulgaria and Macedonia, we can hear this narrative surviving uh, over time. And what's very interesting in the Balkan context and what you uh, underline yourself is that religion is not this separate phenomena from the daily lives of people. It's uh, in the Balkans, it's very closely intertwined with ethnic belonging, but on top of it, uh, there are layers of economic uh, prosperity, of social integration, of uh, state minority relations. Uh, so it, it, is, uh, it is interesting that you chose these three countries and I can completely see why exactly these three countries. Uh, but then, as you show, it's way more complex and involvement with Turkey translates differently in each case. Uh, uh, so you did mention at the beginning that uh, Turkey is invited as counterforce to Salafism. Uh, and then you explained uh, later in your cases uh, how that one plays out in each individual case. And as we have seen in Albania, it's much more different than in the others. I'll come back to the others. 
but I feel like you could spell even more, like come back and say it started like this, but it turned out like this at the end. I'll, I'll come back as I discuss the cases. Uh, uh, and uh, as you have said, uh, I'll come back. To, I want to discuss your key concept, which I really like, the, the co coercive ethno-nationalist unification. And I like that throughout all of your cases, you keep the awareness of the paradigm of domestic and foreign, how these two intertwine, uh, and uh, how Turkey actually has the ambitions to be a regional actor but sometimes uh, even normally ambitions for being a powerful regional actor should translate into pragmatic policies for more power, the domestic developments, the domestic turmoil actually undermine that uh, in the long run when we look at each of these uh, specific uh, examples. So, uh, so it's... Uh, it's good that you actually keep uh, in mind the, the all the time reminding us of the importance of rising authoritarianism that all of these need to be yeah of course the paradigm domestic foreign is important but also the rising authoritarianism that makes the domestic more dominant and undermining uh, in certain ways undermining uh, the foreign uh, you mentioned in the book how problematic the concept of like is, uh, which invites different uh, interpretations in different concepts, uh, and how much in the Turkish religion state relations it, it has to be taken with a different, uh, different view. And uh, you have organized your sections actually according to the type of policy Turkey has. Uh, promote it. And that's something I, I would give you extra points as well for. It's not according to countries, but according to the policies and how these translated, as you have said, supporting the UMA, destabilizing the country, involving others and trickling down domestic, uh, domestic conflicts. Uh, so if I now need to zoom out and think of what could have been uh, spelled out stronger or what could have been expanded more, uh, I will first go back to, to mentioning soft power. And I know you worked a lot on soft power, but I feel like in the book you did, didn't give it as much attention or at least in the theory part. Uh, you're telling us that it's not uh, a good uh, framework for the many reasons you have explained, but I feel like you haven't told us at the beginning uh, enough about it. You haven't uh, told us enough about, uh, and you mentioned on one place that actually you consider that soft power should be measured according to the receptiveness of the subject countries. And you have explained, showed how this receptiveness is different in the different cases. But I feel like you should have told us more at the beginning that uh, the soft power framework actually very much ignores uh, or underestimates uh, that side of the story and the subject country's agency in negotiating uh, foreign soft power. Uh, also, uh, you have mentioned uh, one, one aspect, one conclusion that I really liked about this book is that uh, actually this uh, rise of exploitation of religion is in many ways a result of decreasing self-confidence. It's uh, almost a result of a failure of democratic and economic uh, measures, economic and democratic tools. And that, but I feel like you should have been even bolder in, in that statement. You kind of bring it up at the end. So that's why maybe again, going back to soft power and the intertwining of soft and hard and how it's not easily separable, especially not easily separable when you come, when we discuss an actor like Turkey, authoritarian country with personalized power where all these different where formally division of power exists, but they are very much personalized and blended around the party. <coughs> excuse me. And excuse me. <coughs> Not the perfect time for a cough. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, we have uh, the Balkan countries where also their receptiveness is very much uh, 
dependent, as you have shown in Macedonia, which is economically dependent on, on Turkish support. So this soft power cannot be uh, observed as a separate phenomena. Religion cannot be a separate phenomena. So you do make that uh, conclusion at the end, but I feel like it could come even stronger at the beginning. And uh, as you have said yourself, it's, uh, it's almost counterintuitive. We are seeing an Erdogan who is behaving very boldly, who is very loud, who uh, organizes rallies, and we all know the discursive uh, uh, communication of his power. But actually, the underlining message is that it's a lack of self-confidence. It's a failure of other, uh, other tools in that um, respect. Uh, you mentioned at some point that uh, religion is a must if you're going to analyze uh, Turkish-Balkan uh, relations. And me with the thesis that avoided religion, I must say, I don't totally agree. But you have, of course, have to make uh, your case. And it, in, you, in this particular three cases, it does tell a lot. We do learn a lot about the role of you do make your case you will learn a lot about the role of religion in foreign policy the role of religion in international relations but how that uh, uh, actually affects a whole other wider area which extends to state identity to domestic to foreign uh, etc uh, so that that's what uh, uh, that would be my criticism and also one more thing maybe just an addition to what I have mentioned already uh, you have mentioned that uh, Erdogan is very much invested in the in the role of a leader of a Muslim leader or Sunni Muslim leader of protector of Muslims throughout the world and we see these narratives interplaying in the Balkans but also in the other countries uh, but again as I've said before it's actually, when we look deeper, it shows an insecurity. So to me, uh, maybe you should have uh, made the stronger point that this tendency to be a unifying leader often translates into separatist uh, influences inside the specific cases, as we have seen, and as you have shown through your empirical work, that there was actually a concrete support uh, for particular parties, support for only one type of Turks, one type of Muslims, uh, even uh, undermining stability, undermining cohesion, undermining um, secular cohesion, as you have mentioned uh, in the case of Albania. So just maybe reinforce the impression that uh, the tendency, yes, to be a unifying Muslim leader often translates into actually uh, the, the other way around. Uh, so I think I stayed within my time. I, I should uh, cut it short, otherwise I could keep on talking and talking, but Dimitar should say something as well and we should uh, give floor for questions. Thanks, thanks, Sabina. I think, but if you raise, I think some interesting questions we'll come back to. I mean, one is of course the role of how central is religion to that relationship? I mean, and, and, and that's, I think, an important debate. And also, I think a little bit the elephant in the room is Erdogan, or the, uh, is, is the importance of one person in, in this whole equation, um, which I think we'll also have to come back to. But, um, but I'll first give a floor to Dimitar to, to uh, chip in his uh, observations regarding the book. The floor is yours. Thank you, Florian, and thanks for convening this great panel. But uh, most of all, uh, congratulations to Erdi for putting this uh, amazing book together. Uh, it involved uh, long years of work and I've, I've seen the process as, as it were. Um, thanks for quoting my article, of it, but I wish I had the empirical depth and the conceptual clarity that, that, that you have. Um, I will just make a few very brief points in order to have more time for discussion and then um, hopefully raise a, a couple of questions uh, at, at the end. Um, I think that this is a book that should be read by both people from the Balkans and Turkey, uh, in part because there is this misunderstanding going uh, both ways. Uh, I mean, Turks tend to be very self-referential, which is only natural uh, given the 
the size of the country and the enormous challenges uh, it's grappling with. Um, and they often just assume things about um, countries and regions on the boundaries of Turkey or beyond the frontiers that might or might not be um, empirically true. Uh, and the same goes for Balkanites. Uh, very often people I find um, have certain set of assumptions about Turkey, whether positive or negative, which again uh, conform with the reality, as uh, quote unquote, uh, of Turkey. So this this book, first and foremost, because of its richness and attention to detail and and um, kind of meticulous um, approach to collecting and, and analyzing uh, what's out there, uh, it, it's a welcome corrective. So I, I hope some of the messages, and we had this conversation with Erdi, uh, will find their way into other uh writings uh, short articles even uh kind of more popular um consumption items like opets and so on and so forth so um the very method of the book uh this ethnographic approach um where you actually get your hands dirty and and talk to people on the ground is very welcome because it provides a very um appropriate, a very good snapshot of how things operate at a very grassroots level uh, by all the actors involved, be it party activists, religious leaders, businessmen, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's great uh, to have this reality check, including for scholars uh, and analysts like myself, who might know a few things about the big picture, but uh, don't, do not uh, necessarily have this grasp of uh, voices coming from, from the bottom up. Uh, so this is my first observation. Um, uh, both sides should look at the book. Now let me say a few words about the Turkey side and then the Balkan side. I mean, on the Turkey side, uh, the chief virtue of the book is just exploring uh, this dialectic, this uh, link between the domestic and external, and the point about Sunification. Uh, uh, is, is very pertinent, although, as the book implicitly says, religious uh, identity has always featured in one shape or form in, in the very construction of, of Turkishness uh, in, in, in the modern era. Um, in the secular understanding, uh, religion did play an implicit role, although uh, it was never central, but at the end of the day, it defined who was in and who was out in the national community. And also um, it was uh, there as a potential instrument of the state. Um, so even in, in, in the old Turkey, as we call it, uh, religion was ever present in one shape or form. So that's uh, how the domestically, um, this domestic construction also affected on, on Turkish, uh, positionality within the world. And another thing that features strongly in the book, of course, is uh, how um, the contestations of uh, within the conservative movement uh, in Turkey, uh, especially between the AKP version and the Gulenis version, uh, escalating into a, a really um, polarized fight, uh, especially with the coup attempt in 2016. Uh, have spilled over into the Balkans uh, and other regions, by the way. But uh, the paradox, of course, is that back in the day, the, the, the Gulenist movement, the Jemaat, was the forefront of Turkish soft power. Now it's become a liability. And so much of what Turkey does uh, in the field of religion is not just about extending what it perceives its interest, but also um, trying to roll back uh, the, the, the Gulenists. And well, one interesting nudged there, of course, in the book is this realization that this, this is a battle that cannot be won either side. And now the Gulenists are cornered, but they have proven quite resilient despite everything. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a worldwide uh, observation. Uh, and, it, and by implication, this struggle is likely to continue. But again, this is a theme about the linkage between domestic and external. And thirdly, uh, the whole reform reformulation of Turkish nationalism. 
uh, which again is a product of the AP era, where religion has become much more central to the very interpretation of what it means to be a Turk uh, and what it means for Turkey to be engaged with outside world. Uh, again, remember uh, the, the days when um, there was a certain unease uh, in Turkish policymakers about Turkey being classified as a Muslim nation, first and foremost, because it was seen as something that kind of makes Turkey the other in the European context, whereas now, obviously, it is embraced, it's, it's an asset. Um, so this domestic, but also external um, process is very well understood and explored, uh, both in Turkey and at the very general level, but also how it plays out locally. And I think it's a, a really uh, great contribution made by the book. Um, of course, on the Balkan side, we know all the, all the virtues of the book. Uh, what I find very interesting, again, from a more ethnographic anthropological uh, perspective, is how um, the author's posi positionality plays out. Um, he often has to interact with people on the conservative side, and there he comes across as the, as the quintessential AKP Turk. Um, it's partly to do again with this misunderstanding because in some of those societies, the internal cleavages in Turkey are not really visible. I probably I'll submit that in the Western Balkans, um, the secular versus uh, conservative versus liberal divide hasn't been that much in the forefront in the discussion about Turkey. Maybe Bulgaria is somewhat different because of the more direct link between the Turkish community and uh, happenings going on in Turkey itself. But it's something that really fascinated me, uh, how the Balkan site looks at Turkey and what it sees and what it doesn't see. Uh, and certainly the Erdogan factor has obscured um, internal complexity uh, within Turkish society. And many of the struggles are not in the limelight, um, and which of course reflects on Erdi's, um positionality there and, and the way he's, he's perceived. But again, it speaks to the misunderstandings and uh, lack of communication, or, or the, if it's the wrong word, the mutual interpretations and, and images of, of each site. So uh, again, um, uh, and very often it's, of course, um, mediated by local uh, uh, identity struggles or institutional conditions. And that's a message for the Turks that sometimes they don't, um, because they have self-referential uh, Turkish thinkers, scholars, uh, they understand how it works in Turkey, but uh, very often don't have uh, the insight that Herdi has uh, developed over, over time about how those, um, how shall we say, identity constructions played out at the local level and how Turkish projection uh, tips the balance way one way or, or the other in Balkan societies. So, like I said, both sides have to learn. Uh, finally, a point before I get to the questions uh, on the case study selection. I think it's really healthy that those three are, uh, are bundled together. Uh, and the view from Ankara is a corrective uh, to the view from, from Brussels. This whole Eastern, Western Balkan business it's not very helpful uh, when you analyze society, uh, thanks to the linkages. And there's a lesson also for Balkan scholars more broadly, not just scholars of Turkish foreign policy, that sometimes it just makes sense to go beyond the institutional frames and, and think about I mean, what brings together or distinguishes, say, Romania and Serbia, um, and, and not think about uh, Western Balkans uh, necessarily. So that's, there is a lesson there methodologically for the wider community of scholars of Southeast Europe. Now, let me move to, to, to my, my questions to, to Erdi. Uh, I don't have, as you see, much by way of criticism. Uh, so the first question is, uh, one virtue of the book is that it tries to unpack the, the concept of religion. It's not a monolith, it's not essentializing it which is certainly welcome. And I think an anthropological approach almost um, predetermines uh, 
being critical and, and trying to deconstruct the notion. But it seems to me that religion appears in three different phases uh, here in the book. Uh, and this relationship is touched upon, but never really conceptualized uh, to, a, to, to a more system at a more systematic level. One is religion as a constitutive factor, and the very fact that Turkey again is has been constructed as as a community based on on religion, even if religion was denied uh, under the Kemalist um, um, order. Uh, so that's and now religion is central to self conception. So that's one idea of religion is what Turkey is about. Uh, secondly, um, religion is, is the driver. Um, now the unit of analysis is not Turkey, but the AKP, just because you have a conservative Islamist party at the helm and somebody as Erdogan as well, uh, much of what it does externally might be driven by norms and identities delivered by uh, the right from religion. Uh, so that's the second thing, and, uh, the driver function of religion, a, a causal causal force in terms of Turkish foreign policy. And finally, religion is an instrument. You use it to achieve certain goal because um, it gives you uh, some leverage or influence over other actors in the Balkans. And, and there are places in the book where this relationship is analyze, especially number two and number three, driver and instrument, but there is no coherent theory. Uh, it's, there's an implicit um, understanding of how this dialectic operates. Uh, and if you put your uh, political science hat, just forget the anthropological kind of understanding, um, ex uh, had but moved to um, analytical mode, explaining I mean, how do those three relate? Um, what, if you have to write a diagram and simplify at the at the risk of reductionism, how how the constitutive, the the causal and and the instrumental function of, of religion relate to one another, uh, that, that will be very, very useful and. Um, you might as well consider writing something about it, um, trying to pick and choose from the empirical material. Secondly, moving to the instrumental uh, face of religion, uh, what are the um, disadvantages of using religion? I mean, you, you did mention some of them. Uh, obviously, you are catering to a particular audience. Uh, so if you engage Bosniaks in Bosnia, you are bound to uh, maybe uh, expose uh, identity divisions there and alienate other parts of society. The same applies to Albania where religion uh, is, uh, is a divisive subject. So how does it work? And, and in particular, uh, how um, does it play out uh, in your empirical, um, your, your interviews? Um, it will be good to um, reflect a little bit on that, I mean, we have the intuition that it might be divisive, but uh, do share some of your insights based on your conversation in, in, in the region. Uh, and, and thirdly, my question has to do with something that Sabina uh, brought up. Now, there's this narrative of Turkey exporting authoritarianism. It's an authoritarian power, and like Russia and China and, and the rest. And, and very often, they are, those externals are blamed for um, in, in exporting their model. And you seem to be veering in this direction, saying that secularism is at risk in the, Bal in the Balkans because Turkey is, is doing its uh, e exporting activities. But is that uh, really the case? I, I, I wonder. I mean, how do you export authoritarianism? What is the empirical evidence? I mean, there is a school of thought, and maybe I'm just exaggerating your views there, but you could also argue, as we've done in, in a volume that um, you contributed and also um, Florian was, was one of the co-editors, that many of those problems are indigenous. They are 
uh, local to the Balkans. So you don't have to teach Serbia or Bosnia how to be authoritarian or Bulgaria for that matter. Uh, you might actually uh, benefit from it and exacerbate local problems. But uh, there is no Turkish model that is exportable. Uh, and um, uh, even if Turkey wanted to export it, if it, had, if it did have a model, I mean, how do you accomplish this model transfer? So if you could engage with this notion of authoritarian transfers, how do we, what is it about and how do we know uh, when, it, when we see it, what would be the evidence um, that would be welcome? So let me stop here. Great, Dimitar, thank you so much. Uh, I think you've raised some interesting questions, which I think generally uh, are about the role of Turkey in, in, the, in the Balkans and, and uh, important for discussion. Um, I would first give Erdi a chance to uh, quickly pick up on just some of the points, maybe not all of them, uh, and then invite our audience to also have a chance to ask some questions. And so if you're in the audience uh, and would like to raise a question, please use the raise your hand function, um, which you should be able to find um, on your, on your uh, display. Uh, and then we will, uh, I will call on you to turn on your mic and your camera to ask those questions. But in the meantime, Erdi, if you want to pick up on some of the points made by Sabina and Dimitar, go ahead. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I mean, your, your sentences, your mates, your voice made me very happy, but particularly your, your sentences about my country case selections made me extremely happy because, I mean, when I was a PhD students, I mean, actually before my fieldwork, when I decided to choose these country cases, I got a huge reactions from some, some academics and say that without Bosnia, no, without Serbia, your dissertation would be a rubbish. So now I saw that the experts will say something positive about it. And I'm, I'm quite insisting that these country cases are quite logical. Let me uh, cover most of your questions in a very brief way. The first thing is that Sabina, about soft power and all of the stuff you are exactly right. I should be much more uh, explanatory and should give some, some details. But let me show you something. This is the book and this is my dissertation and this is the volume differences. And I mean, after three, a very harsh extensive review and they found the uh, theoretical background is not that marketable. So they would like to cut the theoretical backgrounds even it's coming from a, uh, coming from a uh, university press. But what I said that, I mean, in the not in the literature regarding power that divided into soft, sharp, and hard power. And they said the, 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 the relation and the boundaries between these powers are very blurred. But when we look at the Turkish or the Balkan studies regarding soft power, I mean, most of the studies are very crystal clear. This is soft power, this is soft power. There is no connection between each other. No, there are some connections, intersectionalities, and at the same time, there are conflicts. I mean, one country, likewise Turkey, can easily promote language, uh, soap opera, and at the same time, uh, get, a, get a financial investment regarding the gun industry or the weaponization. So one country can do these two at the same time. And it is impossible to categorize every single society in the same bunch of people, same category, and if you're gonna shoot the arrow of soft power, it will hit in different parts of the societies in a different ways. So therefore I define the, 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 the ambivalence of soft power while using religion and culture. And thanks a lot for uh, saying very good words regarding the course of ethno-rational unification, but where does religion stand for? Uh, Today in the breakfast, we were talking with my wife about by Bahar about the Turkey's critical junction and how these dialectics, dialectics coming like day by day, very similar and same. Yesterday, uh, one member of parliament, Ömer Gergerlioğlu, he's a very coming from a very conservative and at the same time a very religious background. His member of parliament skipped out by the AKP government because of his opposition views, but we know that the competition at the same time in the field of religion. At the same time, within the same hour yesterday, uh, the high court uh, opened their uh, closure uh, agreement to the uh, pro-Kurdish party, HDP. This happened in 2021. Not exactly 100 years ago, but 96 years ago, in this month, in March, in 1925, Atatürk's government 
declared takriri sukun, it's some maintenance of order or some uh, state of emergency regarding to protect the secularism, Turkish secularism, and Turkish nationalism against the Kurdish rebellion. Even though we saw that Turkey is a very dynamic country, there's a huge transformation and every single day, many political uh, critical junctions has been occurring, even if, like for example, in Sweden, it would be happening in five years, but in Turkey, it would be happening in six hours. No, Turkey has been dealing within the same problems and two big problems are still on the table. One is Kurdish issue, the other one is religion. And indeed, there is no reflection, there is reflection, but not direct and visible reflection of Kurdish issue to the Balkans, but the religion issues is very important because Turkey or the Ottoman Empire was the former emperor of the region, not using only language, but main, mainly using religion. And still, when, when I mean, I conducted most of my interviews, like mostly 40, 45% in Turkish, 30, 35% in English, and the rest I use translator. But in the Turkish, most of my interviewers and the locals, they, they, they behave me using my name Ahmed, one of the names of the proper Muhammad, because I am, a, I was, I am, or I was, I know, I don't know, maybe I'm still a Muslim brother for them, not Öztürk. This is, I think the religion is a very uh, big indicator. And also, I mean, also this, and also uh, I would like to combine the question with the Demeter, this Sunnification and the using religion. In the book, I think I try to underline that I'm not arguing that there is a Sunnification or over, uh, there is a conversion to a more religious in the society. In the opposite, in the, in the opposite, in Turkish society right now, there has been increasing deism, increasing atheism and agnosticism, but, in the state mentality, state behaviors, when you look at the Yunus Emre Institution's uh, booklets, when you look at the Tikas investment, or when you talk with Baba Mondi, you can see that how they suffered about the overdose uh, investments to the Sunnis in the region. This is about the state mentality. And But my question is that uh, when we talk about the, again, to combine with the, uh, with the uh, Dimitar's question regarding the power components, Currently, Turkish presidency chair actually divided into four pieces. Erdogan and Islamist is one piece, indeed. Nationalist is another piece. Euro-Asianist, they are like pro-Russia, pro-China, or against the Atlantic coalition is the, is the third piece. And the Islamist communities, Sunni Islamic communities, they try to fill the gap of the Gulen moment is the fourth component. We do not know which of the components will stay in power after Erdogan. So if some of the main determinants, likewise nationalists and the Islamist communities will stay in power after Erdogan, Erdogan is 68 years old. I mean, he might stay in the power more, 15 more years, that's all, no more, but the Turkey will hopefully will stay after himself. So who, if, if these components will stay in power, Turkey will use religion and nationalism one way or another to be not the control, uh, to be visible in the region. So this is the characteristic of the Turkish state. So, and the, 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 the thing about this, uh, before kind of coming to the civilization part, I mean, the AKP and the Gulen movement and conducting research. Uh, currently, I've been, I've been almost finishing a, a research article regarding how to conduct their research on the sensitive areas and particularly with the Muslims. I converted my uh, fieldwork experiences to, a, to a, a research article right now, and I realized that currently it would be impossible for me to conduct the same research. Because in these times, nobody knows me. No, when, when you Google me, you can only reach my Facebook, my Twitter, no, no research article, no opinion pieces, nothing. It was very easy for me to conduct that research. But at the same time, it was glorious for me to observe the Turkey's transformations in the Balkans. For example, in 2016, I conducted an interview with the big brother of the Gilan movements in North Macedonia with a very luxury balcony looking to the water river and having a good coffee. In 2018, we, talk, we, we, we talked with him one of the bathrooms of one of the luxury coffee shops in the, in the non-Muslim parts of the city. So this was the 
because on these times they were visible, very legitimate actors, but the other time they were escaping from the intelligence service or other, other, other extraterritorial authoritarian tools. So this gives me a quite leverage, but right now it is impossible for me to conduct all of these researches. Uh, Okay, from I'm now changing my head from an anthropologist to a political scientist. I don't know how to manage to that, but uh, Dimitar, touch, sorry, just don't change your hat for too long because okay. we do do get back to you know, do answer a few more points, but then I want to open the floor to to okay. the audience. But go ahead. I mean, religion, identity, and power, and also civilization and the transformation. I think they are interchangeable. I don't know which one is the first in terms of hierarchy because they've been affecting each other, not only under the Justice and Development Party period, but also it has been happening since most probably the uh, Kanuni Sultan, uh, uh, Sultan's second Suleiman period. So this has been happening all the time in, the, in Anatolia, this is my view. And now I'm stopping here. Hey, great, thanks. You can catch some breath. Yes, we have a few questions. Laszlo, um, why don't you go ahead, Laszlo, you can turn on your camera and your microphone and we can hear you then. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, you raised very important points with which um, I all agree, but I think there is one point that uh, you talked less about is uh, the role of the discourses in the relationship between Turkey and some Balkans leaders. So what do you think, um, to, what if, to what extent uh, does um, President Erdogan uses the Balkans and his relationship to leaders to position himself as a regional leader, which might be appealing for his electorate, and the same can be told about leaders in the re region like um, Alexander Vucic, who magnifies the role of Turkish investments uh, to become more popular, or Hashim Tachi, who tries to upgrade his um, position as a credible politician internationally. So what do you think whether uh, this assumption holds water? Thank you. I think we, like three of us, we should share that questions to answer, but thank you so much, uh, Laszlo, for this question. I, I, I mean, at the very beginning of my PhD, I tried to make a, I tried to first learn and then conduct a critical discourse analysis regarding to the Balkan leaders and the Erdogan's discourses to the region, but I couldn't manage that. Yes, the discourse has been playing a huge role, but at the same time, what we know from the Turkish politics, and as far as know, I know from the Balkan politics, discourse is a palliative concept. And it has been renewing itself day by day, but some of the normative and the institutional impacts are much more influential and would be not permanent, but uh, they've been, been long lasting than the discourse. And to combine your question with this authoritarian uh, discussion, I think I'm sharing the same ideas with Dimitar because I mean, Turkey has been uh, has never been a perfect democracy. It's always been a fragile, problematic democracy. And there have been like three official and three unofficial coups in the history of Turkey. It's an amazing number. I mean, it's, it is a success for a country if there will be a calculation of a coup. And in this regard, I think no one will learn anything about Turkey in, in terms of authoritarianism or democratization. But the relation between leaders are quite important, but I'm not thinking that neither Vucic nor Erdogan or the other leaders will support each other to enforce their positions in their home countries because beyond that, they are very pragmatic political actors. I mean, I think they are, yes, they are authoritarianism. And I, I, I know from Florian's new books about the competitive authoritarianism in the region, but they are at the same time very pragmatic. So if they would see any kind of an interest to to, 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 to engage or to create some different types of collaboration with other, other, other leaders, they can easily find it. But it is also normal that what we know that from Tottenham, it's impossible to, for authoritarian leaders to establish long lasting and the true relations with the democratic leaders. So they're in one camp, the other ones, the others are, are the other camp. Thanks, thanks, Eri. Um, any other questions from the audience at the moment? If you do have them, just raise your hand. Uh, I mean, use your raise your hand option. And if you can't find that option, you can just turn on your microphone and camera, and then we will see you as well. That's another possibility. And I mean, I mean, and maybe I kind of pick up uh, the question which Dimitar raised, which you just also responded to, is about you know the exporting. I mean, is there really an export going on of this model? And I, and I, maybe this is also something Sabina, I don't know, maybe one wants to talk to. Um, and, you know, I would also agree with the question to me that, of course, I mean, Vucic and uh, Djukanovic and all of them don't need Erdogan as a role model. 
But at the same time, you know, isn't there something structurally about the interaction between, you know, these kind of types of populist authoritarian, which is mutually reinforcing because the way they deal is, you know, the leader comes and they make a deal. It's very much centered on the personality. It's also, I mean, we haven't brought in gender, but there's a strong element of masculinity. I mean, I remind you of the recent website of uh, Viktor Orban, where he has, you know, the subsection of man of power, uh, right? And uh, I think he has a subsection where he's shaking hands with Erdogan, as well as with Vucic, of course, and Yanis Yansha and uh, and uh, Putin. And, and so, you know, this kind of the, the masculinity of this power. So that says that, you know, isn't there something which is mutually reinforcing, even if it's not about kind of emulation? I'm just kind of wondering what, what Erdi, your take is, and also Sabina, because I know this is something you're also interested in. I mean, uh, mascul masculinity or like the patriarchal, uh, patriarchal relations is one of the main characteristics of Turkish politics. Mm -hmm. And Erdogan is not abusing, but coming from that kind of political culture. Yes, we know that the Welfare Party National Outlook Movement uh, is very much owed to their women to reach the power in mid 1990s, and even in their organization in the Balkans, the women have been the women had been playing one of the key roles. But this is an instrument role. This is a very motive. Mot but this is a very motive type of uh, role. So. Regarding this masculinity, it's a part of the uh, partial populism of Erdogan. Yes, there is a collaboration, and at the same time, but they are individually patriarchal, authoritarian, right-wing, and pragmatic and aggressive leaders. So, I mean, they shouldn't need to be need to join the same club. They might, they might open and establish their own clubs individually. I think there is one issue they've been affecting each, each other, and Erdogan is the leading actor, is the blazer uh, jacket. This is all. Blazer suits, that's all. Regarding authoritarianism, repressiveness, or the discourse, or the pragmatic political discourses, they don't need it themselves. Sabina, let me bring you in. What's your take on that? Well, I do believe that there is an added value to be in the company of all the good men, but um, it's, it's a performative value in a way because uh, it does add regional power, which might not uh, always be as material, as impactful, but it does have that discursive level. It does have that uh, performative level just by the sheer, and it's, we also have to bear in mind uh, how the whole system is set. So when you have already an authoritarian system, when you have such an extreme fusion of powers and concentrating it around a single figure, then it's much easier to negotiate solutions with the other side. And especially for me, this is very visible vis-a-vis -vis Serbia, Bosnia uh, negotiations and Turkey. Uh, especially when you, we are facing a stage when EU is more hesitant, when we, there is a withdrawal of US leadership. And that's a vacuum where Erdogan obviously wants to take advantage of uh, and uh, the whole uh, peace road, the trilateral meetings, uh, uh, even, even if uh, certain investments are not as high, even as if they are not as impactful, just uh, having pictures together, meeting seven times per year, opening a large strategic project, being able to directly negotiate adds uh, the notion of uh, regional power. Vucic can brand himself as regional leader only with the presence of Erdogan. Uh, it is with the presence of Erdogan that he can be a Tito-esque figure, uh, the leader or the inheritor of former Yugoslavia, uh, the leader who has power beyond the borders of uh, Serbia. It's not something that Merkel would allow him. It's not something that Brussels would allow him. It's something that in partnership with uh, Erdogan, it, it opens a, a separate uh, how should I say, operational space, which is maybe sometimes more of a theater than actual operational space, but it does have this added value. That's my take on it. Uh, it's more performative very often and time will show how much of these uh, 
budding up actually had an impact on the regional politics, how many solutions were brought, how many investments were actually made. But currently, it, it does serve a purpose. That's my take on it. Thanks, thanks, Sabina, for that. Um, we see if there are any other questions. Um, if we have a very timid audience today. They're intimidated by all of you. Uh, yes, Erdi, go ahead, go ahead. But, but from my point of view, every single country is its own dynamics. Even though they've been supporting each other in terms of dominance in the region or being much more repressive, this doesn't mean that there will be a dominant effect during if one will lose an election mm -hmm. in one day. Yes, there is a collaboration, but this doesn't mean that if something gonna happen, I don't think so, Erdogan will lose election in 2023, uh, will which which it will lose later on, and then Urban, there will there, there will be no uh, domino effect in the region because their dynamics are very different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also I think this comes back to some uh, Dimitar's point, which I think is important, is that uh, you know the knowledge I mean the knowledge gap about both ways is quite big. So so uh, you know I, of course people emulate. There is a you know there's always an emulation, but it's not a you know although there's many connections, it's not a shared space. So, so in a certain way, um, you know I think what happens in North Macedonia is perceived in Serbia, it's and, and vice versa, and Montenegro and Bosnia. But Turkey is is kind of this semi-external. I mean it's both it's both within the region much more than China is, for example, uh, of course, but it's also outside because again besides Turkish communities in the region or a few uh, established minority Minorities who still, or, or a few people who know Turkish, very few do know, um, to follow Turkish politics beyond the kind of very superficial. So I think there's a, there's a, you know, even if things were to change in Turkey, that wouldn't be necessarily uh, read in the region as something which has a direct effect on them and probably vice versa. So in that sense, they're still kind of separate spaces, even though they are closely intertwined in, in my understanding. But a, a question maybe to all of you is, is, is kind of asking you, because of course you have, you know, uh, on the cover of the book, you have a very nice picture of, of, of course, and you know, the, the, the man in the room is, is, is Erdogan. Um, is, you know, how much is, is this about, you know, uh, Erdogan and the Balkans in the 21st century? I mean, of course your book is about much more than Erdogan, uh, but you know, if, if I'm also looking through the many images, your book has Erdogan keeps repeating. And so the question is how central is, I mean, we talked about the system of authoritarianism, but the, the particular individual which is so much part of the Turkish system now and the whole after the constitutional uh, changes even more kind of institutionally in, embedded. But how much is this, you know, is this a one person system? And, how, you know, as you said, I mean, no, nobody rules forever. Uh, what will be the legacy of, of that, uh, you know, Turkey's engagement? Because again, before 2001, Turkey's engagement in the Western Balkans or in the Balkans was quite different. I mean, it was not absolute, you discuss it in a chapter, but, but it was quite different. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, is this is this shift which occurred in the last twenty years? You know, something which is likely to remain irrespective of who will be uh, leading Turkey, or is this so much tied to this one person that uh, you know uh, this this kind of uncertainty uh, will will um, you know will become then an issue again of, of what that relationship will look like? And I would like to ask this to all of you th three, of course. But Erdi, why don't you go ahead first? I mean, this is this is a difficult question. I, I don't want to do any any kind of futurism after Erdogan, but what I would say that after Erdogan, if there will be a smooth and peaceful power transition, I mean, Turkey will deal many different issues, and these issues would be bigger than the the the, the importance of the Balkan and Turkish politics. So after Erdogan, it will be a catastrophe, and I would say that maybe there is a restoration, but maybe there is a there is a kind of a I mean, the, the cards will re revolt, but I don't know how we would we be that. But I can I, I I have an answer about the importance of Erdogan in the region, particularly in the eyes of the middle class, lower middle class Muslim uh, components or Muslim citizens of the Balkans. Among these people, in the eyes of these people, most probably Erdogan is much more popular than being in Turkey because there are three different issues. The one is that we've been seeing a huge personalization of power in Turkey. For example, during the, we were in, we were in a meeting with Dimitar in the, uh, about Aspen Institute, and we talked about the COVID investments or supports or health diplomacy of the 
external or inter inter international actors in the region. I, I talked about Turkey and what we saw that in every single packages that is being sent, sent by Turkey to the region, you will see that the presidential uh, flag and the name of Erdogan, not the Turkish Republic. So who is sending these sports? Turkish, Rep Turkish Republic. Actually, citizens tax are being paying all of these investments, but it's been sent by Erdogan. This is the first thing. And it happened in every single kind of a critical junction in the region. The second thing is that Erdogan has been working with a good company of a, uh, image, image makers for the region. And there has been a, there, I mean, uh, Lasko asked a question about the discourse. And Erdogan's discourse is echoing in every single corridor of the Balkans, not only official transnational apparatus, Turkey's transnational apparatus, but also semi-official or non-official religious or other civil organizations. For example, I would like to give one example from the book uh, in, two, uh, in, the, in page two, uh, 205. You will see a, a pizza shop. I mean, in, in Albanian, in Durus, there is a pizza shop called it's, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And people suggest me that you should go to that uh, pizza shop to, to conduct an interview for them. And I said, why? I mean, it should be a one pro, pro Erdogan is Turkish individual. And I, they said, no, the guy is, is a Wahhabi. And uh, I said, OK, now it's time for me to go to the pizza shop. And I conducted uh, conduct an interview with the owner. And he's a Wahhabi. And he's coming from a very different religious background. You know, there is a huge competition between Wahhabis and the Erdoganist groups in the region all around the world. But he told me that Erdogan is the only guy who's been supporting Islam and the Islamic flag with wearing tie and talking with the Western leaders, not the, not the leaders in the Gulf country. And for example, in the in the book, there are some also other notes. In the in the in the train station of Strasbourg, I saw a Kosovo citizen, and he told me about how Erdogan is successful to fight with the non-Muslims all around the world. Erdogan is fighting, not Turkish military. Erdogan is doing, not Turkish foreign office. So the personalization is, of power is very big, and therefore Erdogan is a big figure than Turkey right now. But after Erdogan, it's very hard to guess anything. I mean, even even the, even in the contemporary Turkey, it's hard to make any any conception, any guess for for tomorrow. Exactly because it is such a central figure. I think that's of course the the, the issue. But uh, Sabina, what's what's your take? Well, uh, as Erdi has said, there is actually a polarization. It's mentioned in the book uh, that Balkan people have different. Uh, uh, attitudes, but the ones who support Erdogan, they don't support him, they admire him. It's like absolute admiration. And, uh, and it's very much related to those uh, kind of savior protector narratives. And actually the fact that he's authoritarian, this whole image of a strong man is obviously very appealing to some uh, Balkan Muslims because I guess in the light of the 90s and everything that was happening, uh, it's giving them some notion of empowerment or however. And also in international politics, in foreign politics, he discursively very much manages to communicate that image of, of the Muslim protector. So obviously it works and uh, it works uh, for a certain amount of the population and it works very well. So, well, of course it works because they, I mean, they benefit, as you say, symbolically and, and otherwise from Erdogan. But unlike Turkish citizens, they don't have to bear the consequences because I guess no Bosniak or Albanian has their, their savings in, in Turkish lira, if you see what I mean, or, 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 or live in Turkey. So Erdogan is, is basically an asset. It's not a liability for you. Mm -hmm. um, for me, what was very interesting is to observe conversations between Bosniaks who moved to Turkey and their relatives who stayed in Sanjak. And there are these fierce discussions of uh, how good or bad politician uh, he is. Whereas the one side, the Sanjak side is in absolute admiration and the Turkish side is like, no, we lost so much money. We are getting poorer. This is getting more difficult, etc., etc. And in terms of predictions after Erdogan, I mean, just having the example of Serbia and other countries, each time you have increasing authoritarianism, we have increasing undermining of state institutions, uh, increasing blurring of uh, uh, rule of law of everything. So I don't want to be pessimistic, but it will either have to be uh, Erdogan too, or 
not so optimistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> difficult, Thanks. very difficult. Yeah. But I think, I mean, again, the interesting question is really about this kind of the way in which Turkey has become much more involved in the in the Balkans. Uh, and, and the presence, of course, is much more than one person. And so that, of course, is not going to disappear overnight and, and uh, uh, has also these multiple dimensions. Uh, which... If I have to, to lead on this one, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of structural things happening because, mm -hmm. of course, Erdogan accounts for 80% of everything, but again, geography and the growth of the Turkish economy. So by structural, by necessity, Turkey will be there. Mm -hmm. Whether it will be staking political claims or, or, or be visible in, in the way it is now, and whether um, Turkish domestic affairs will have repercussions uh, in in the countries of the region. An example, the, the Sarajevo rally in 2018, um, maybe not, but uh, much of the policy beyond the, the kind of personalistic will, will still apply, I, I guess. But another question is that Turkish economy is like, we should find a new concept to define the Turkish economy. I mean, it's far beyond being a fragile right now. And how these, I mean, even though, okay, normative impact, religion, language, culture, that's all fine. But one way or another, it will, they, they, need, they need some financial resources to support and to conduct all of these activities. And it's getting quite difficult for Turkey in the upcoming days. No, but, but think about it, economy works in, in, in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. Think about the border town like Edirne. Because of the Turkish economy going down, prices are also going uh, yeah. down relative to the euro. As a result, you get many more visitors from neighboring countries for, for weekend shopping. Right. So those connectivities are very resilient. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Turkish troubles do not necessarily undermine the linkages. Absolutely. And I think, of course, I mean, considering the size of the Turkish economy in the comparison, especially to the Balkans, it's quite clear that no matter what will happen, um, that will be an important player um, in the region. I mean, that seems quite, quite clear. But at the same time, we should keep in our minds, I mean, yes, Turkey is in the Balkans, but Turkey is all around the world. Right now, Turkey has been supporting mosques in Cuba. So, I mean, how uh, that country will, 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 will support I mean, mosques or institutions in more than 190 countries. Mm. So I'm the pessimistic side of that coin. Well, the Turkish engagement in Cuba might fizzle out before it does in Bulgaria, North Macedonia, <laughs> or Albania, or any of the other countries. But I think we have to we have to uh, leave it at that. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Erdi, Sabina, and Dimitar for, for uh, giving your time and uh, talking about the book, which I, of course, mm. highly recommend for anybody. Um, please read it. Um, thanks for the audience. We'll also have this video uh, available online. Um, and also we'll have a series of further talks about Turkey in our center this semester. Uh, Thursdays we'll have uh, several events. Uh, please look it up. Also our brown bags will focus both Turkey and the Balkans. So uh, look at them and uh, join us in some future sessions. So thank you all.